Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Join host Sanjay Puri as he explores the dynamic and developing world of artificial intelligence governance. Each episode features deep dives with global leaders at the forefront of regulating AI responsibly, tackling the challenges using AI can bring about head on and enabling balance without hindering innovation. Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to bringing diverse global voices together to help build fair and equitable AI regulation. I'm your host, Sanjay Puri, and today we have a truly fascinating guest joining us. We have Yap Van Etten, a diplomat turned entrepreneur with over a decade of experience in China, working at the Dutch Embassy in Beijing and the Consulate in Shanghai. His unique background has led him to found Datena, now the leading provider of techno-economic intelligence on China. Yap, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to our podcast. Welcome to the show. Sanjay, it's a pleasure to be here in your podcast. Looking forward to today's conversation. Wonderful. Yap, uh, for our global audience, can you tell them about your journey from, you know, you were a diplomat and now... You are a tech entrepreneur. What inspired this transition? Um, actually, the struggle that I have uh, and had in my own work uh, to just not being able to grasp uh, the growth of China uh, with uh, just manual labor um, and seeing that China's innovation policy uh, wasn't only having benefits for the West, but actually also had a potential negative uh, outcomes. Okay. So that kind of led you to say, hey, uh, I really need to do something. Um, so you said it had some negative outcomes for the West. Um, can you uh, explain your company, Daytona's approach to open source intelligence and how AI plays a role in that work? And explain what is open source intelligence for our audience who might not know what that is? I'll start with the, uh, with the latter. Um, so what is open source intelligence? Um, this relates back to your, your first question. So what I saw in news articles when I was uh, working there, um, was that state owned enterprises in, uh, in China, uh, were buying, acquiring Dutch high tech companies and European high tech companies. Um, I saw a massive amount of innovation, uh, state funded innovation, uh, state funded research projects, not just at universities, but also state funded research projects. Um, at companies, and I felt, how large scale is this? How many of these acquisitions are actually state funded? How much of this R&D is state funded? Um, and when I was menu collecting information, going to websites, downloading PDFs, uh, copy pasting stuff into, into Excel, I, I, I could see uh, the outlines of a picture uh, of a Chinese industry policy um, and, and that is in, in itself, it's open source intelligence already, where you're using public information, news articles, government publications, uh, university publications to, uh, to get intelligence on, on something else. So in this case, on the uh, Chinese industry policy, um, what I struggled with was because of the size of China and the speed of innovation, um, to do this at a large enough scale that made sense for actually giving into input to our policy in that case uh, at that point our, our Dutch innovation policy so given my background at a at the search uh, at the search engine before I became a diplomat I felt that if I can combine that knowledge that I have with the knowledge uh, that I have about China and in the OSINT the open source intelligence that I see uh, out there on the Chinese internet if I can make this into a mass scale innovation uh, collection system, that will really help seeing the bigger picture, uh, but also on the, the granular side. So um, in that sense, that is what Detena is doing. It is basically what I could do on my own. Uh, so manually collecting OSINT on Chinese industry policy, but then at a scale of maybe doing it 50 times larger because there's basically no limits to what you can do with a software system. So uh, you're basically using AI to really uh, ingest so much data that it, you're gathering and then try to figure out, uh, you know, do data analysis to really get gather data points, right? Yeah. Cor correct. There's actually three points where, well, 
in the fourth quarter, I'll get to that. Uh, three points where we used AI. So it's on the data collection side. Um, oh, really knowing which part of the data uh, is interesting that you need to collect. Then there's the uh, analytical side. So once you have the data, uh, what does data mean? How can you merge it together? Which data point can you connect to what other data point? And then there's the interface side where you can also use, and we also use AI. Um, so for instance, uh, with our uh, AI assistant, which is a, an LLM, where people can type in questions that they have when they are not used to our interface or have a question which our interface doesn't capture yet. So these are three pillars. And then a fourth pillar, I always tell, tell people, well, uh, we also track China's AI. So that's the fourth, but it's not part of our product, of course, more of a, um, a side effect of um, uh, our product. How do you think the cultural differences uh, between the West and China impact AI development, uh, especially in China, or just overall? We, we, you know, the West has a certain approach, especially the US. Europe has a certain approach. What is China's approach to AI development? Yeah, that, that, that's a great, great question. Um, I thought about it in advance because I had a, uh, it's a question I, I get more often. Um, what I saw in my time in China um, and I saw in my time in Europe and more recently in the past years, my time in the US, I really saw three different mindsets um, that you, what you see when you meet both the common people uh, and the politicians, uh, because politicians is often like a accumulation of what the general public does or, or top down. But in China, it was very much more often about um, control. Um, it was already when I first arrived in uh, 2005 about how can we control uh, 3G, uh, how can we control uh, television, uh, we were still a big thing, uh, just general like uh, linear television. So innovation, how can we control innovation into the right flow? Uh, where here is in, and that, that is still, still the same for, for AI, where in, in, in Europe it's about um, how can we regulate AI to protect our citizens. Um, and in, in the US, it's how can we foster uh, and stimulate uh, AI innovation? All three have different uh, pitfalls uh, and, uh, and advantages. Um, so there's, I wouldn't consider there's one better than the other, uh, but it's very important to, to, to know that they are so distinct because it also means that companies who are active in Europe uh, will initially create their whole business model, their mindset, their, their, their company values, or even their ethical like uh, uh, checklist to a European mindset. And then when they go to, to China or to the US, they have to be very wary of that and, and, and be aware of that. Um, so that's a that's high level differences I, I think exist. Yeah. So, you know, you've had a long experience in China. How has that shaped your understanding of the global you know, technological development sphere that happens, uh, yeah. Um, what I experienced there was firsthand the real hunger for technology um, already. Uh, and now we're talking more about it with the recent uh, export control uh, regulation being a lot tighter than uh, than before. But already already in, 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 in early as 2013, um, I really noted that, that there was a, a hunger for technology that China wanted to be um, technologically independent from the from the West for economic, uh, nationalistic, and military reasons, um, and this 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 hunger for technology comes from the fact that in the past they have been, well, sometimes they made their own mistakes in the past, but they didn't get on the bandwagon of new technology or the whole initial revolution too late, um, but they've been excluded from certain technologies more often in the past. So for them, it's really the build or buy decision that we, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands can make, if we can't build it, if, if it's economically not viable for us, or the best decision to to build something, we'll just buy it. Uh, but for China, that, that didn't work. Uh, and on top of that, the country is large enough that they could uh, consider like, let's just build everything in house. And at least uh, we have the key to the technological kingdom. So that's a different mindset. Um, then, then what we have in, in the West, it was all about optimization. Capitalism is about optimization of resources. Um, and that, yeah, that doesn't go well if you um, try to mix it with, with a focus of an industry where they say, 
first thing, we want to have everything uh, um, in-house. Uh, second thing, is we optimize. Uh, but but first, it's really about... So that that's what I really experienced firsthand with the Chinese um, government decision-making. Um, at the same time, I saw in the Chinese entrepreneurial mindset, a lot more the U.S. spirit um, to really uh, build fast, uh, break things, try hard. So... Th that, that was um, really inspiring, actually, to, to see that in my time in China. So the entrepreneurs are like uh, U.S., you know, uh, take risks, build fast, but the government has some state controls. Yeah, uh, one question I had for you, and uh, this is something that's fascinated me, is China has been ahead and talked about being a leader in AI for a, a large period of time. From the top down, the government has talked about AI. Now in the US, it's since ChatGPT came out that we've now got an AI national AI policy. We're really pushing hard. We want to be the leaders, et cetera. Why is AI so important for China or for the Chinese government? Is there any specific reason? I mean, you talked a little bit about build versus buy. Is there some cultural history of being left behind as you talked about? But what is about AI that is driving them? And obviously, there are some other technologies, but AI, e electric vehicles is something else. But uh, for our listeners, that would be, uh, what's about AI? I, for me, when I um, lived in China, I've been to um, stem cell facilities. I've been to uh, nuclear power plants. I've been to uh, advanced material institutes, uh, big data centers. Um, to any kind of, and I've had CEOs and CTOs coming over from all these technologies, but also my own assessment was already more than 10 years ago. And I think I even wrote a LinkedIn post about it. Um, when are um, you going to have your um, Kasparov moment? Um, when are you going to experience that AI will outcompete with you? So in that sense, I think uh, the Chinese government just came to the same conclusion that AI is... Um, one of these like technologies that enable a lot of other technologies. This is an enabling technology. Um, so there's many emerging technologies, but there's only like a, a handful of enabling emerging technologies. Um, I think the Chinese leadership is, um, and there's quite some um, um, meetings taking place in Beijing. Um, They're called like Fragrant Hills uh, meetings where um, government is educated on new technology. So stem cells uh, and AI were already covered in the early 2000s there. So the, the leadership is, um, many of them have an engineering background, uh, Western educated in the past at least. Um, so they have a real understanding of technology. They know that they've been behind for a very long time. So they're always looking at, okay, um, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So looking back at history, we see that new technological breakthroughs are what makes the winners and the losers. If we want to be the winner, we have to identify the new breakthrough technology. So that is what they did. They've identified that AI is going to be the new technology where winners and losers are going to be made. So we have to be the winner. Then we have to be the best uh, at AI. Um, don't get me wrong, though. Uh, in the West, several people, I think it was already at the at, uh, Obama administration, um, in the, um, the Office of Science and Technology that wrote that AI was on the same level as nuclear technology. So it's not that we didn't know it. It's just that for some reason, action wasn't taken with it. Um, and, and that in, in, in China uh, was, was done much faster. Um, and I think that, that comes from the Chinese entrepreneurial mindset in the, um, uh, with, the, with the entrepreneurs. In combination with, with leadership, that was very much in favor of like, okay, if you pitch something good on technology, we'll give you the money. Um, yeah, I think that, that worked really well with them. Yeah, so there has been some element of visionary leadership also. We have to give that credit to the Chinese government that they have been thinking far ahead. Uh, it's a different approach. Uh, yeah, there have been all kinds of indications that they have the largest number of AI experts in the world. What does your intelligence tell you? Uh, is that assessment right? I mean, that's considered like a fact. You talk to uh, AI experts here in the US or Europe, they'll say China has the largest number of AI experts. 
right? The academic system of, of China in general is, is vast. Uh, so the amount of engineers being output by their academic system, yeah, that, that, that is indeed like uh, if you have uh, um, the amount of population in China, you uh, start educating them uh, again, uh, opening up universities. Um, that was just a matter of time before that would happen. I do still see that um, it varies a lot. Um, Per topic still, um, I would say that certain certain topics, uh, like in our fields, so we do a lot of natural language processing. Um, you see Chinese across the board everywhere. It's really um, a lot of Chinese papers are, are really great. I still feel that in uh, in more in chip design, AI chip design, uh, or um, uh, adversarial uh, technologies on, on on imaging technologies, um, still the quality papers can still be be, be lower, but. I have to agree with the uh, um, the experts also um, from the academic uh, side in this field that yes, uh, Chinese output is 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 substantial. Um, still, um, you can say that that on the LLM side, even though that I said that on, on natural language processing, China is really great. Uh, the West still beat uh, China to the point. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you talked about chip design. As you know, the U.S. has put restrictions on some high-end chips, especially NVIDIA GPUs, uh, to go to uh, China. We even started putting controls in the Middle East because they were, there were rumors that they were finding their way into China. I've had some guests here saying that this might slow them down, but this will not stop them because the state is now determined uh, to make sure that they're independent and they're ahead of, uh, they're ahead in AI. What are your thoughts in terms of these san sanctions? How is it impacting them? Is it, put, how, is it putting them behind by a year, two years? And uh, what, are, what, are the, what is the Chinese government doing about this? It's, it's it's hard to put an exact number on it. Uh, perhaps customers that, that that use our data uh, um, uh, can ex can actually do that when they have when they can combine it with 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 other information. But um, when it comes to what the effect will be, of course uh, they're going to invest more in, um, um, in 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 whatever uh, technology being blocked. Um, but they were already doing that anyway. As already mentioned to you, um, they want to have full autonomy um, in key technologies, including AI. So, yeah, it might make it even more pressing to do this. Um, but I don't know. I think already like uh, uh, was it ten plus years ago there was already um, um, a, a university where a professor was forced to create a. Uh, Digital signal processing chip um, that eventually got so much pressure that, that he, he used a fake chip to put on the market, um, um, and, and one of his PhD students actually uh, was a whistleblower in China that that time, saying like, oh, "No, I, we were just buying chips in Japan and rebranding them as a breakthrough." Um, and I can really understand uh, how how such a professor comes to it. Like that, that's just like there's so much pressure to to do to to move forward. Um, but uh, certain things take take time, um, and it's a lot easier to make progress in software. Um, so in, in just pure software AI, uh, but when it comes to uh, to chip design, where uh, you have to have what the Germans call like a finger speech in the field, like you have to know what you're doing. Often it's it's you have uh, have to have it in your fingers. Uh, so it's 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 an whole ecosystem. Um, just imagine that I don't think that that the U.S. or uh, Japan willingly. Uh, gave uh, the company uh, ASML a monopoly. It's not that they didn't try to 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 build their own lithography machines. Um, they're also really probably unhappy with the fact that uh, we have one supplier. Um, so they also really really tried and to have access to the entire re rest of the ecosystem. So they they can buy equipment from Japan from Europe, um, and and they still can't manage to. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I do think that that. Uh, don't underestimate the out of the box thinking of the, of the Chinese. So, certain key elements they can come up with something different. Like if I were the Chinese, um, I would try to follow the West in one pathway, but also have enough um, uh, time, money available to try something completely different. Um, that would be my guess. 
Um, uh, that would also be my guess, and I, I, th I think also honestly that's also what we're what we're seeing, or what people should should expect. So, um, I think the amount of uh, unknown unknowns uh, is going to increase from uh, from China on this on this field. So the known unknowns will uh, increase, and you talked about ASML, uh, which is a key player, and there are now I think they had put some restrictions also on uh, selling some of their equipment into China. Uh, yeah, in your experience, what are some common misconceptions uh, about China's uh, technical uh, capabilities and intentions that uh, people have? Um, one that is hopefully less common, but um, in the uh, in the early days, uh, I ran to it often, and I'm still going to address it now. It was that when I first started tracking Chinese innovation and people were mockingly telling me like, oh, then you must have an easy job because China can't innovate. Um, that still happened 10 years ago. Uh, like this this quote is from, from like uh, 10 years ago uh, when I was just about to start, to start Daytena. Um, and um, yeah, to this date, that is in certain areas, still people underestimate um, the innovation power that China has. When I went to these Chinese companies, I could see that what they were doing there was also just fiddling, like trying stuff. Um, and yes, it was then, and I'm talking now about the semiconductor industry. Um, and yes, they were trying the things that, that you felt like, okay, probably not going to work. But the fact that you're trying this uh, means that you're not copying. Um, because uh, there's quite some literature out there that this doesn't work. They're really trying to start to, to do stuff, so that it means that 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 eventually uh, they will figure things out. Uh, so that 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 did came to the conclusion like, hey, this is the kind of mindset that the people people need. Um, um, I think that uh, the pressure people are under uh, to reach targets. Um, I'm talking about the professor that basically like, yeah, of course he didn't want to get chip. He didn't want to do that, uh, but just that the pressure amounts to so much. That you start um, uh, faking these uh, things, um, and we also had that, that kind of things in the West as well. Other publications, so I'm not trying to like talk down one uh, one nation over doing, but in, in pressuring this uh, in, in the semiconductor industry is really what I uh, what I saw there. Um, I yeah, the, the size of the country um, still the, the size of the ecosystem, um, the differences. Also, if you go to one place, one province, one city. Um, can be completely different than from another city. So if you go to uh, uh, Shenzhen, you will see certain type of innovation. And because the markets are so large there, um, it might be that for these kind of companies, it's worthwhile to innovate on this small component and not do something else. So you might think, oh, they're stupid because they're not innovating this and this part. But for them to make money and just become a multimillionaire, um, Fine. Um, so I, I think in, in, the, in the beginning, people said China only copies. But yeah, if you if you can become a millionaire with just copying, why would you make a risk to innovate it more, spending more money, right? If, uh, very hard to convince an investor to say like, hey, uh, if you pay me this, I have 10x uh, return. And if you pay me a lot more, I might have 20x, um, but not sure. So th I think that that's that's also a legacy that, that copied in China. Um, yeah, that that's that's it's happening. It's still happening. It happened in the past, but um, get new data. Um, I would say, like, depending on what industry you are, like every month, every quarter, like, do a deep dive again to reassess the the state of technology in China. Don't don't think about oh yeah, I went there last year uh, and that's that's it. So what you're saying is things are moving very very fast. And they're they're not just uh, you know copying and cloning things. They're innovating things, and they're uh, make you know they're ready to uh, make mistakes and learn from them. Is what you're saying, and that's what our listeners should uh, keep in mind. Well, one one other thing, like uh, what I also often hear is that it, that China they they do this for um, uh, control and surveillance, and it's just often mentioned because it just yeah makes it for a nice article in the newspapers. Um, um, but it's less sexy, but more uh, involvement. Like they also do for economic growth and global uh, competitiveness. So uh, to out innovate um, 
the, the global competition. Um, I think that's also something that people often overlook. Yeah, I mean, and I think uh, if you overlook that, I think you need to just look at TikTok and the AI algorithm that exists in TikTok and uh, look at the success they've had. And uh, now there are several other uh, examples that are uh, coming in. But just shifting gears a little bit, uh, yeah. What do you think? I mean, you are uh, data is uh, basically in the business of helping, uh, you know, some of the policy making decisions, policy decisions, et cetera. What do you think of the use of AI in policy making and policy decisions? Um, it's a uh, um, you have to look from 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 two sides. Uh, one side, I think, like it's 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 great, amazing. Um, it's it part of what we what we do and I, and I even think that um we haven't even scratched the surface of our potential uh, us as a company and actually yeah, our uh, our clients when it comes to how much better um, economic policy foreign policy uh can become if you have ai to support you uh, to see all the connections um at the same time um, you always have to ask as policymaker, what's the data lineage? Uh, why am I making a decision? So that should be uh, key. Um, so uh, in our in in our software, uh, uh, if customers want to want to know each of the data points that they see, uh, we have full data lineage. Uh, we even know uh, the ethical framework, how the data got collected. Um, I think that is. That is something that is key for for decision making because you'll start to trust these AI systems more and more and more. Trust is good, um, but being able to to check is is, is better, um, and I think that that is that is that is key. Um, and it will be more and more almost like a, a must have if you have like, just imagine our GDP growth from our average country. Um, one percent can mean the difference between recession or or growth. Um, so it, it it's about small details. If AI can help you to have like half percent or one percent better economic policy, okay, this is amazing for your country. Um, so we haven't seen the beginning of this of this this yet. Right. So what you're saying is it can really lead to some tremendous productivity, tremendous growth, uh, per se. Uh, um, let's, you know, uh, how do you think, uh, and we've had guests come here and talk about this, but do we, should we have AI legislation address concerns that are, you know, related to, you know, the AI-enabled autonomous weapons? And it, should there be international agreements or regulations for that? I mean, as you can see, when you look at current wars, there are several going on. Uh, it's heavily based on autonomous weapons, whether it's drones or other warfare. Um, there is no uh, consistency or some specific regulations around that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Yeah. Um, but I think it first starts with... Um diplomacy on this topic, uh, have an open channel, open discussion. Different countries will have different starting points on, on what kind of legislation is, uh, is, is required. I do see the potential uh, pitfalls. Um, the same thing that I, that I just described for the economic advantages of using AI, AI policy, uh, will be the same, of course, for AI in, uh, in military applications. Um, and then it's one thing to have better military planning. I think that is that it feels more benign uh, to use it uh, to that extent. Uh, you can tailor to minimize casualties uh, or to just outcompete uh, strategy. But uh, autonomous weapons, it will be hard to make legislations stick at this moment we have to be honest uh the, the global trust in the world between large countries is 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 not what it should be um uh, so countries uh, trust each other less now than they did 10 years ago 
yeah, it's, it's going to be tough to have a global uh, legislation or regulation in, in place. But at least I would say like some kind of red phone line on it, akin to uh, and, and the nuclear threats. Um, um, start working on something now. What if an AI experiment went out of control? Um, is there a phone number that people can call each other like, okay, I made a mistake. Uh, yeah, can we help with each other? Uh, maybe we should have some kind of AI legislative boards in general, not just for the for the uh, for the for the laws, but also for um, um, AI in in general. Like uh, we have WHO, if a new infectious disease comes out, um, there's su such a body. I think to at least collect information that I think is the bare minimum. Let, let, let's at least start with uh, with that. So uh, yeah, if I. Uh understand correctly, you're proposing that there should be something like a AI hotline uh, that somebody, if something happens, then you can pick up the phone uh, just like with a, you know, with a nuclear. And then you're saying a regulatory body like you have the IEAA, the International Atomic Energy uh, Group, something of that nature that would be a coordinating and other body. Now, you know, there are con AI nationalism has become a big thing, as you said. China did it, but now almost every country, or at least a lot of countries, whether it's in the Gulf, the Middle East, Asia, etc., are trying to say, "Hey, I don't want to be left behind. I, I didn't make it in the nuclear club, but I don't want to be be left behind in the, so to speak, AI club." Now, if you Look at that. How can you balance the national interest with the need for international cooperation uh, for AI regulation? Because you have the EU doing their thing. You have US, we have elections coming up, and then China is doing their thing, and other countries are doing that. How does, you know, what is your perspective? How do you balance national interest with the need for international cooperation? Um. Short answers. I, I I don't have an answer. Um, I think it's that it's it's again when it comes to economic security, national security, like a government has um, has to provide two things to its citizens. This is like um, food to eat, um, uh, economic security, and uh, a shelter, shelter, um, which is national security. Um, AI. Falls in the middle of that, so it's it's like for yeah, you need this for economic security, you need this for national security. So it's going to be hard to defend uh, government policy uh, of a country uh, and they say like, okay, we don't care about AI, we'll we'll buy it from someone else, um, unless we get like really strict agreements within Europe. Uh, I can see this. So in European Union, where we say like, okay, uh, let's facilitate this. Um, yeah, maybe other umbrella agreements where we do this, but I find it hard to think that that if countries really understand what AI will do in the in the, in the coming uh, the coming years and 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 beyond, um, AI, I even would see it as a as a um, I, I would doubt I can take a, a government uh, sincere or um, seriously if they don't have a national policy on uh, on AI. Uh, hence my my first answer. I don't really have an answer to how we get it, how we get out uh, because it is the duplication of uh, of measurements and of uh, of investments, which is which is yeah not ideal uh, to say the least. Like uh, it would be good for uh, um, for the um, the shareholders of uh, Nvidia and uh, and the likes uh, and for ASML probably as well to have uh, semiconductor factories all over the world. But for uh, the world, it will be better, I think, if uh, if that investment goes into renewable energy, for instance. Um, so, uh, as you said, um, you know, things are changing. So, one of the things Jensen Wong, uh, who's the CEO of NVIDIA, has suggested to the leaders of different countries that every country should have their own AI to preserve their culture, language, and be independent. Uh, what do you think of that thought? I think it's um, more true than most people realize. Um, it is the influence that AI has 
uh, on your thoughts, um, your line of thinking. Um, I have never found anyone yet that overstated it to me. Um, everyone that, that, that tries to overstate it is actually understating it. It is the, let, let's say this, this my, my watch has, has AI in the, okay, in, in the near future. Um, and I'm just talking to it and giving it like, hey, I read this new book on self-improvement. Um, 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 let me help stick to the, uh, the rules. I just want to, uh, to do this. That book is written by someone. Uh, I will start to change my thoughts on this. And this is active thought. But what if this, it's not an active thought, but this AI is built by someone else. Um, that can be very benign. Even, even the fact that it's, it's a US AI means that it will be first in English. So people um, who are better at English will first do it in English. Then it's about uh, English books, which are more um, uh, online, or English text, which is more on the internet. Um, so if I look at uh, the Dutch language, as a, as, as a kid, as a 10-year-old, I was um, a very much a beta person. I like mathematics. And I was always complaining, why are, why are we learning other languages as well? Uh, this is time better spent on, um, well, on, on math. Actually, I just want to learn English and I can skip Dutch, uh, then just have to learn one language, and then I can focus the rest of my, my brain on, on learning math, uh, physics. Um, but um, later, I also got to understand that the culture in itself is also a kind of like a generator of, of new ideas. You don't want to have a monoculture because that can lead uh, the humanity down the wrong path. Um, if you uh, we become like a, a N is one experiment, and that's already yeah, what some people say, of course, the whole globe is an N in one experiment, but it's even accelerated if we don't foster the different cultures. Um, and I, I, I see this a lot in the Netherlands where, yeah, a city where we are in Eindhoven, um, uh, in our own company, I think half of the people are, are, are um, not Dutch. Um, and I see the, the city becoming more and more English. And, and it's, Fine, actually, I enjoy it because I've lived abroad so long that actually sometimes it's, it's really enjoyable to just speak English and to be able to to mingle with other cultures. Um, that does mean that after a while uh, it becomes a a blend. Um, that blend can be good; it has advantages as well. But to have an AI, I think that 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 preserves a certain culture uh, where there's value in in uh, in that. Uh, which can create out the box ideas is is important. And I think that's what he is referring to. That uh, otherwise you'll just get a one monoculture um, uh, uh, with a cookie cutter uh, with all the ideas from yeah basically the US uh, as the leading AI uh, LM developer at this uh, this moment. No, so as you said, uh, you know different countries need to do uh, their thing. Um, one thing that's, um, you know, a lot of the lawmakers that come on our show yeah, talk about is that AI is moving so fast. Every day there's something, you know, it's uh, first the LLMs came out, then you have uh, multimodal, then you have agents, then you have, you know, text to video, Sora, just, and there's, I'm just covering some of them. How do lawmakers, uh, you know, stay ahead of the curve, produce regulation, uh, legislation. That's going to impact a very changed world in, forget five years, but even in a year's time, and that our laws don't become obsolete. Um, different ways to approach that. Um, first, just hard work. Uh, uh, running a company, running a scale-up is, is like immensely a lot of work, uh, what I do. Uh, but even I spend time on Coursera, uh, uh, learning lang chain in the evening, weekend hours on Saturday or Sunday, uh, because I want to be able to, to be the best CEO for my tech, uh, part of the company and, and for my clients that I know what's, what's going on. So, uh, it's identifying this trend and just spending your own hours on it. Um, secondly, uh, uh recruiting staff, uh, with this knowledge. Uh, so identifying again, like what are the key things or having a, what I used to be, I used to be a science and technology attaché, just, just have a science and technology officer on your, on your staff. Um, uh, thirdly, um, this becomes a bit more how we devise governments. Um, it depends a bit per country, uh, per government body, how this could 
could work. Um, 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 to a certain extent, this goes a little bit in 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 in, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, if you are a party in Parliament with just one seat, that's fine. You you get the one seat, and the good thing about it is you get diversity. So uh, uh, if if a party cares a lot about animal rights, um, and at the beginning they, they they just get a small amount of people voting for them, uh, they still have one seat in Parliament, and maybe they can grow to two or three later on. So uh, something which is not important enough to make it to the global agenda of all parties can make it to the agenda of one party. That's the good thing about it. The bad thing about it is that if you have maybe like a, a hundred seats in, a, in, in, in parliament, um, if you are a party with like 12 seats or 15 seats, um, probably one of those 12 people um, has a technology background or, or two of them or three of them. Um, and, and you can share and divide and you can, or you can have like one science and technology officer that you share among them. But the moment you have more parties, uh, all like single, uh, or, or double or three, like uh, seat parties, they all have to know about everything from tax to technology, to agriculture, to energy. It's really a lot to take care of. Um, and it, I, I think there, um, having a, yeah. That will probably also have downsides having a lower limit to how many seat people should get. So at least they are capable of being knowledgeable um, in a certain sector. Or additionally, if that doesn't work, or if you really want to keep uh, um, uh, the chance for, for, for parties to have just one seat in, in parliament, a more generic uh, um, office for science and technology that, 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 that gives lectures and lessons um, to the policymakers, uh, where they have, so it becomes just like a curriculum. I think they just have to have like a, um, yeah, a curriculum where they spend time and we force them to spend time. Now they spend a lot of time on debates. Um, and I think that if we just force them this time, you can't have debates. This is just for learning about the new technologies. And every week you have to spend time. If you're not there, uh, you get cut on your budget or something like that. You force them to make uh, time available for this. I think that's a good point is force them or force them or incentivize them to uh, make time um, is what you're saying. Um, yeah, uh, you know, tell uh, our listeners what lessons can be learned from China's rapid technological development that might inform global AI regulation. Um, it, it links to, I think, I think what you just uh, asked me. Um, when I arrived there in 2005, uh, I did a research on 3G. So um, 3G mobile phone. Uh, they didn't have 3G yet. Um, I was still playing Snake on my phone if I was uh, in the, the subway with nothing else to do. Um, and um, they waited uh, several years to introduce 3G. And now they're on 5G. Um, in, in, in 10 years' time, I had to ring the alarm bells uh, in 2014. Like, hey, um, this Chinese industry innovation policies really have a negative effect on, on ours. Um, and uh, another 10 years later, uh, they're now the global uh, 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 player in many key technologies. So what do you think where they will be in 10 years from now? I think a lot of policymakers in the West um, still uh, think in linear steps um they 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 heard about moore's law uh but they think like okay moore's law is only in semiconductors but but it's it's in any breakthrough technology it's in ai uh i think in, uh, in genetic engineering uh, they're even outpacing moore's law um and uh, so i think that is what we can learn from china's fast pace uh the world is uh, malleable changeable if you're behind now, if you feel that you're behind, um, you can still catch up. It's, it is, it will go like this. Uh, you can be on top of uh, everything on one day behind the next and uh, end up as number one again uh, uh, weeks after. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of advancements in AI technology impacting national security concerns, what uh, should be some considerations that legislators should keep in mind when they are framing AI-related legislation. Um, 
three things come to mind. I think uh, for doing, we talked about national security with uh, um, influence operations, um, military capabilities, and um, uh, cybersecurity, I think, will be the third one that I want to mention. I'll start with the, uh, the, the last one, cybersecurity. I think AI, um, AI hackers, um, and, and then also AI defense. Uh, if you don't do that, um, it's, it's, it's pointless. Uh, when I was still in China, uh, the Chinese Great Firewall was um, no, uh, um, and, uh, uh, cumbersome um, at, at, uh, at points uh, because yeah, you want to look at websites in the, in the West and uh, sometimes they're not available. Um, um, so you start reading about uh, uh, technologies to circumvent them. And um, I think it was an Italian researcher at some point, like, uh, and this is already, again, like 10 years ago, but this is like a public uh, thing to talk about, so t I can talk about it. They used genetic AI algorithms to find holes in the Chinese Great Firewall, uh, and they could. Uh, they published a paper about it, and later on, the Chinese uh, plugged that hole. Um, uh, but it was interesting to see that, that, that already at that time, like a, an AI application, and since then I've seen AI applications that could find... Uh, um, 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 backdoors, uh, uh, unintentional backdoors in, in open source uh, code. So this is going to be uh, a massive uh, uh, challenge. Uh, it might turn out that the world gets more secure to so become like AI against AI. Um, and that at some point, like uh, before we release new hardware, or new, new release new software, we have like a massive neural network to, to find out if this is uh, rigid uh, code. But um, at least uh, short term, uh, really, um, cybersecurity is going to be a new uh, new game. Um, then the then the influence uh, campaigns. Uh, uh, you were talking about TikTok. Um, I, I was talking about uh, how uh, every AI will be able to influence people without knowing it. Um, uh, if people uh, people think that a social network uh, was able to nudge people into a different direction. I'll think again if if you're if you have an AI whispering in your ear without even whispering it, it's just one. Basically, you could you could ask an AI, "Hey, this is the person. This is what I know about the person." In one hundred steps, how can you get this person from this opinion to that opinion? And it will like guide the person, in like uh, not overdoing it, but giving one message, uh, one word difference, one this, one this. Um, and, and and also backing off a bit when the person is like responding differently. Um, it might even use impersonation uh, with that, so fake, uh, deep fakes. Um, so I, I see there a, a, a massive challenge uh, where a post-truth kind of like era uh, has started and I don't think we even realize it yet. Um, and then the third one, uh, which was the second one that I mentioned, the military capabilities. Um, I'm a big fan of um, um, sci-fi, um, and it's often an inspiration to get new ideas. Um, one thing that always struck me as weird uh, was with any kind of sci-fi uh, series you saw uh, in space, people were flying, and then when things really got tough, they were like, let's switch to manual now, and then they, uh, the good uh, person uh, uh, got out of things and like, yay, thanks to good flying. Like, what? No, this this is never going to happen. Like it's like AI will will do things that you can that you have one million inputs uh, and you'll fly in ways. And um, why is it even a person there? Because uh, who cares? Like six G, as long as uh, the titanium can hold it, let's do this. Uh, so I, I think that 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 um, AI in, uh, in 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 military capabilities, um, it's it's yeah, the sky uh, is not even the limit because um, yeah, space is also there. Um, so I think that that's, that's going to be a real uh, a real threat. No, well, that's a pretty comprehensive uh, evaluation that you've done. Um, you know, even in the EU AI Act, and even uh, with the conversations that uh, Senator Schumer had, the EU AI Act um, doesn't address. Um, the military and the intelligence uh, side, and nor does the U.S. side. How do legislators balance the need for secrecy in national security operations uh, 
you know, with the public's right to understand and scrutinize the use of technologies, and especially as it relates to regulation, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a tough one. Like my first thought always still is um, we wouldn't publish the blueprints of uh, a nuclear bomb online either, uh, nor would we publish uh, a DIY kit on how to make a new virus online. So it, 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 my first glance would be we don't know yet what the new nuclear bomb is. So what the new? So I, I feel that. Um, the government is in the right to to hold back a bit a bit on on publish, uh, publishing what groundbreaking research is and and then yeah uh, first assessing themselves what what does it mean uh, um, I, I'm hoping that at least like-minded countries have uh, some kind of board uh, where they can discuss things uh, or at least at a national level um, like in the Netherlands we also have an oversight committee on um, our intelligence uh, agencies. Uh, I think that, that that should also happen. So if uh, um, a new AI development is taking place that has potential military applications or where the government is saying, like, we want to keep this a secret for, for, for a while, that there is an independent uh, auditory commission that looks at this decision. Um, um, so but first, I think the government, I think they have a responsibility there to to do, uh, think carefully about what, what it means to... Uh, to open source that also taking into account that other parties might not do that so then you're spending a lot of money um into recent and and, and, and development and then um hey we found something is that immediately taken by someone else um at zero or no cost and they will do things with that which yeah you might have not want them to do no that makes a lot of sense um yeah um yeah, uh, we have a, a big audience out there, legislators, think tanks, and others. Um, what would your advice be as they are all, you know, working to put together uh, regulation and legislation around AI around the world? What would your, with all the years of experience you have, is um, what what advice would you have for them? Um. I would start with scenario planning, foresight, foresight exercises um, to really ask different people from different backgrounds, uh, make assessments on slow advancements, fast advancements, um, assessment on like what kind of industries, what kind of uh, sectors, what kind of uh, parts of society are going to be um, uh, involved. Um, and, and uh, make assessments on, on on what the effects would would be, both positive and negative, um, and make this into a a, a kind of like a national dashboard, uh, one public one and one not public one, um, where the non public one eventually uh, with the delay becomes public, where governments are regularly updated uh, on the advancement. So maybe related to your question, um, how can policy make it keep up to date? Well, I think this is part of that. Um, these things can, it's, it's, it's like this, this leverage, uh, if a new technology is being developed, if, a, um, in our own business plan from 2013, 14, we had AI assistance, um, for our tool. So that actual control unit, um, could just ask what technology can I export to China? Or uh, if I export this technology to China, what are the risks? Or within this sector, who are my competitors and why? Um, I had no idea how to do this. Uh, I did know that at some point this technology would come. Um, still, if you asked me like a year and a half ago, I would have still said, still quite a bit away before this is like uh, uh, ready for. And then, yeah, OpenAI launches uh, ChatGPT. Uh, and that overnight, you have to change your business plan. Um, so the government also needs to be in a position to do that. So that's like long-term planning, uh, making these foresight assessments. Um, but now things are going so fast, it has to become a dashboard for them. Now this is to, it's it's really strategic thinking uh, mixed with the technical operational uh, uh, thinking. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. Um, in conclusion, uh, there are two schools of thoughts, at least. 
um, around the world that we should engage with China as far as AI safety regulations are concerned, or uh, we should not invite them uh, there. Now, I do know that when President Biden met uh, President Xi in California, AI, uh, and AI safety was discussed, and it's going to be discussed again, too. And we have a NATO summit coming up. But should they be uh, brought to uh, the discussion in terms of what we want to do is in terms of global framing of AI legislation? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Without knowing, of course, all the details, um, what's going on in these kind of dialogues, so, uh, that's the uh, this, this disclaimer there. Uh, again, my first thought will be, yes, do invite them. Um, it can be to smaller parts. That can also be the case. If you really feel like, hey, we have to discuss something uh, which uh, gives away too much about our technological capabilities, um, that I can understand. But... Um, I think China would also understand, and they will complain, of course, about it, that they won't be invited to everything. Um, but, um, well, then you can just ignore it, complain, and just continue with a, with a smaller group. But to not invite them, I think, would be a, a, a mistake. Because um, if they make a mistake with AI safety, uh, it will affect all of us. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, so it, I think it's... Um, there's always, yeah, okay, um, our communication and our under mutual understanding and, and our systems work is not great now. Uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're not in the same uh, situation that we were uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, that, that, that's, but, but I think we all hope to be in the same situation again where we actually feel like, hey, uh, we have one world. So if we screw up, like in, in terms of energy, pollution or AI or nuclear threats like, yes, there's a few people in the world out there where I sometimes doubt if they have the right understanding of, of, of this concept. Um, but at least um, 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 I'm, I'm hoping most people in power have an understanding of this, that, that we have one world. So keep an open dialogue, uh, agree to disagree on a few things. Um, but yeah, this is uh, the open dialogue will be my first uh, first first um, assessment. So keep an open dialogue. That's what Yap uh, is suggesting. He's an expert. Yap, towards the end, and like I said, I have so many other questions. We'd need to get you back here. But towards the end of the podcast, we try to ask some uh, a few questions in the lightning round, uh, and you've got to. It's a Pick one of the options, one of the two options we give you. Um, are you ready to take on uh, a few questions for us? Sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, what would you prefer, national AI policies or international AI frameworks? Um, international AI framework. Okay. Uh, security or accessibility, what would you prefer? Security. AI regulation by technologists or AI regulation by policymakers? I'm hoping the policymakers will be technologists, but I'm go going for technologists. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, what do you, in your view, is AI a greater risk or an opportunity for society? Opportunity. Finally, uh, should autonomous weapons be banned or should be, they be allowed with restrictions? Uh, I don't think we have a choice there. So uh, it's going to be uh, allowed with restrictions. Wonderful. Uh, that is been a great, great uh, session. Uh, really, really, um, you know, Jab, thank you so much for sharing your really invaluable insights. You have such amazing perspective. Uh, you know, you bridge diplomacy, you bridge, bring entrepreneurship, deep, 
technological understanding and a Q, uh, you know, are you providing a critical viewpoint in this complex uh, landscape of AI regulation, given, um, you know, what's happening globally uh, with the, uh, the U.S., the Europe, the China relationship that's evolving. You know, as we've discussed uh, to our listeners, the challenges of creating fair and equitable AI regulations are immense, but so are the potential of uh, getting it right. And your work at Datena, you know, provides uh, critical intelligence to governments worldwide, and it's undoubtedly playing a significant role in shaping informed policy decisions. So uh, thank you for being part of our uh, Global Conversation uh, app. And to our listeners, I hope this discussion has provided you with new perspectives and food for thought. So until next time, this is Sanjay Puri signing off. Yap, again, thank you. This was uh, fabulous. Uh, really enjoyed it and would love to have you back uh, for part two because there's, uh, b believe me, I have a feeling like two months, three months from now, there's going to be so much more uh, to keep you busy and for us to have. So thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Regulating AI Innovate Responsibly podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on the show. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review.